Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 28 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. With me today is Jefferson Morley, a veteran reporter who has covered stories for the Washington Post, Reader's Digest, Rolling Stone, and many other publications over the years. He's also a world-renowned expert on the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Jeff has covered the Central Intelligence Agency extensively over his long career in and around Washington, D.C., and I invited him on the podcast after I picked up one of his most recent books called The Ghost, The Secret Life of CIA Spymaster James Jesus Angleton. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Justin. I look forward to our conversation. Terrific. Yeah, so do I. James Angleton is, of course, someone who has come up you know, many times in the research that I've been doing about the Cold War over the past couple of years, unsurprisingly. And I think mm -hmm. that just about anybody with any knowledge of Cold War history probably knows that name. But, you know, he's, yes. quite frankly, he's a very multidimensional, very mysterious guy. And I still don't feel like I have really got a handle on him, even after reading your book and so many articles and everything over the years. <sighs> I, I share the feeling, Justin, and, and I dedicated a couple of years of my life to understanding the guy. He is a protean, elusive, complex character who has to be evaluated on many levels as an intelligence professional, as a covert operator, as a public servant. So he is an important figure in the history of the Cold War as the chief of CIA counterintelligence, the first chief of CIA counterintelligence, a position he held from 1954 to 1975. So while he is very important, there's also a lot we don't know about him. I uncovered a lot about him. There have been some other good biographies of him written in the 90s. I think I advanced the story and expanded a little bit about what we know about him. But he was super secretive, and his records were not ever fully disclosed. His operations caused a lot of concern within the CIA and were investigated by the agency itself after he was forced to resign in 1975. So an important and sometimes mysterious figure in the Cold War. Yeah, no question about it. And so he's obviously an enigma, and you spent like you said, two years researching him. So what was it that led you to decide to write a biography on him to begin with? Well, a lot of people have, have been fascinated by Angleton over the years. For one thing, in retirement, he was quite bitter about the circumstances in which he was forced out. And he made a point of taking journalists out to lunch here in Washington at the Army Navy Club and regaling them with his take on the intelligence wars between the CIA and the KGB, along with his theories of history. And Angleton, whether you like him or not, he was an incredibly charismatic man intellectually. People who met him were impressed by his genius and his mind, his, his unique creativity as a covert operator and as a, as a thinker in general. So people gravitated to him. I had written my first book about the CIA was a biography of Winston Scott, the CIA station chief in Mexico in 1963. Our man in Mexico told the story of Win Scott's rise to that position, which he held for 10 years. Well, Win Scott had been friends with Jim Angleton. And so in the course of doing the first book, I learned a lot about Angleton. I, I got a photograph of him that had never been published before, a photograph of Scott and Angleton together. And so I learned a lot about him. So in some ways, he was a natural follow-up to my first book, Our Man in Mexico, because they were the same generation of the CIA. They were friends and ultimately rivals. They had a lot of history in common, but they also took very different paths to power. Win Scott was the ultimate field man, station chief, you know, running operations on the ground, you know, implementing CIA operations on the ground. Angleton was the master of office politics at CIA headquarters. To be sure, he ran operations, but he was a different type of operator. And 
ultimately very powerful. He had his hands in multiple very important policy issues facing American presidents between 1954 and 1975. That's why he's important in the history of the Cold War. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, his name just comes up over and over again. But let's kind of yeah. go back to the beginning. Of course, that's always the best place to start. So from a young age, I mean, he was kind of, I wouldn't say steered, but kind of driven toward this eventual position. So can you talk a little bit about what it was about him as a very young man that eventually led him to the CIA and into intelligence work in general? Well, he was a comer. I mean, he was the son of a self-made millionaire. His father, Hugh Angleton, ran the international business, the National Cash Register Company franchise in Italy and became very wealthy in the 1930s. James was a literary type. He was very well traveled for a young man. He had lived in Italy, in the UK, and in the United States. He lived out west in, from, in Boise, Idaho, spoke several languages, Italian, French, and English. So when he got to Yale in 1937, he was a remark, considered a remarkable figure on campus, a little mysterious, a little more mature than, than his classmates, much better traveled. And he was recruited into the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA, during World War II. He immediately distinguished himself with his intellect, his, his ability to master lots of information quickly, and his, and his quick mastery of secret operations. And he becomes the head of the OSS station in Rome at the end of the war. And so he sees secret negotiations with the Nazis, secret negotiations with the fascists, undercover operations against communists and fascists. He sees the whole panoply of U.S. intelligence operations at a very young age, before he's 30. And he impresses all of his bosses immediately with his mastery of this new Profession. So when the CIA was created in 1947, Angleton moves effortlessly into its ranks. And from there, he rises quickly to become a force within the agency. So he brings this a lot of connections. His father was very well connected in Italy. So he brought a lot of intellect and connections to his career in the CIA. And that's why he rose rapidly in the ranks of the agency. He was an incredibly talented guy, like you said, but he had that upbringing and he had those influences. And, and not to mention, of course, being in being in the Ivy Leagues in the late 30s and early 40s was a, a great channel into the CIA. I think anybody has noticed that about the early days of the CIA for sure. But I think if I recall correctly from your book, he was something like 21, 22 years old and already in a position of serious authority and influence in Italy as a young army officer. Is that right? He was like 28. He, yeah, oh, he had graduated okay. from college from Yale in 1941. He spent a year at Harvard Law School. Then he went into the OSS. He was trained in England. He served in England and then and then moved on to Italy and, 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 and finished the war in in Italy. So but yes, he was he was involved in very sensitive, high level intelligence operations mm. before he was 30 years old. And in Italy. He had this life experience there previously, I think you mentioned, and he made a lot of very influential contacts, people among, I guess, organized crime, and there were some fascist holdouts, I guess, from that time period. Is that right? Can you expand on that? Yes. Yeah. You know, he cultivates the, this was one of the things he was great at was he cultivated a wide range of sources. And so through his father's business connections, he, he was well connected with the fascist elite of Italy, which was defeated by the American army. He had good contacts in the Vatican because he served in Rome and he knew Rome. He knew Italian. He had, and he had contacts in organized crime. When the U.S. invaded Sicily in 1943, one of the things they did was they made a deal with the organized crime clans of southern Italy to make sure that U.S. troops weren't hindered or, you know, they wanted the cooperation of the organized crime people. And so Angleton helped broker some of those deals, some of those arrangements. One of the most significant things I think that I point out in The Ghost is a story that was known, but I add a lot of detail to about how Angleton protected several high-ranking Nazi and fascist leaders after the war, protected them from prosecution in the, at the Nuremberg trials so that they could serve as sources of U.S. intelligence after the war. So this was another way of, of, of how he cultivated high-level sources, was by protecting them from 
post-war justice. Right. There was quite a bit of that going on on all sides, as a matter of fact, at the end of the war. I think those guys were being snapped up by the, the highest bidder. It seemed like a lot of former Nazis and I guess some Italian fascists as well were being divided up among the Brits and the Americans and the Soviets and everything. So he was able to grab a fair share of valuable contacts. Well, yeah, the, yes. I mean, and the men that he helped were responsible for mass murder of Jews. I mean, that was the criticism of him from some people within the U.S. government, that these were wanted war criminals. They weren't just, you know, other sources. And I, I identify a couple of cases in there where Angleton cultivated these sources and maintained them and they were never brought to trial as some of their as some of their Nazi colleagues were. Right, right. That's that's really a a tough situation. It's a really complex situation to discuss because you know you need the people that can do things for you and that have contacts and influence in these these underworld organizations that you need to penetrate. Absolutely. But no, you and, can't and, just ignore everything they've done before that either. Right. And but this was Angleton was very was very good at this. He was very good at enlisting the, the you know, the sympathy of sources and, and and extracting the intelligence that he wanted from them. He was a, he was a gifted handler of agents. I would put it that way. In the if you're talking about sort of the intelligence profession, do you think that his his gifts that were present, like they were they were apparent right from the start, were they natural gifts of his, or were they cultivated by really good mentors early on in his career, or a mix of both, or what? I, I think it's a mix of both. I mean, he was an incredibly intelligent man with a very retentive mind and very creative mind. So he came with a lot of just natural ability. He also learned from some of the best people. Norman Holmes Pearson was a literature professor at Yale and also an expert in espionage. And he was a teacher at the OSS school where Angleton received his training. And he became a mentor of Norman Holmes Pearson. He also benefited from the training of one of his British instructors, Kim Philby, who it turned out would be a Soviet spy, but was a, a gifted intelligence professional in his own right. And Angleton became friends with him. So Angleton both brought a lot of natural ability to the job, family connections, but he also trained with some of the best people in the business. And remember too, you know, after the war, the United States had never had a foreign intelligence service. The FBI had a few offices overseas, but we never had a foreign intelligence service, unlike the United Kingdom or the Soviet Union, which had had intelligence services since early in the 20th century. So these, the, the pros at the work of secret intelligence were the Brits and the Russians, and the Americans had a lot to learn. And so Angleton was part of the generation that was catching up. And it's important to note in that regard, you know, Angleton created some of the, you know, the very processes that the CIA still relies on today in terms of handling agents and organizing operations. So he had this formative influence on the CIA. And the most dramatic example of that is the position that he eventually had, the, the chief of the counterintelligence staff. In 1954, Angleton was a rising star in the agency. And but the agency was having lots of problems because the Soviet espionage service was really more experienced, more skillful, and was able to penetrate the U.S. government and run operations in Washington. And in fact, you know, Kim Philby was an example of that. He was a senior British intelligence official who was actually working for the Soviet service. So Angleton proposed to Director Dulles in 1954 that the CIA create a counterintelligence staff to detect these threats. Counterintelligence, of course, is the defensive aspect of secret intelligence work. It, with espionage and covert operations, you are attacking the enemy with, you're stealing their secrets, you're organizing secret operations. With counterintelligence, you're protecting yourselves from the, from the other guy doing that to you. And so Angleton said correctly that the agency had a real need to improve its counterintelligence. And so Dulles, created this position, counterintelligence staff, and put Angleton in charge at a young age. So Angleton had that position, which had not existed before. It was his creation. It was his idea. And so that was a part of his influence on the agency was this elevation of counterintelligence as a priority activity. 
Right. He's probably the most famous American practitioner of counterintelligence, I would say. But at the same time, the U.S., I mean, historically, we have a pretty bad track record of counterintelligence. We've been, you know, penetrated successfully over and over again by multiple other foreign intelligence agencies, you know, with some very famous characters I've already talked about in the past, you know, Robert Hansen and Aldrich James and Kim Philby from the Brits was over here for a while, of course, but he stood out as a very successful and knowledgeable guy. But do you think that perhaps his his methods and his personality and his his level of power they kind of interfered or were they, did they assist with our counterintelligence during his reign over the CIA office? You know, in, in the book, I say what, what some other scholars of the CIA have said, and I came to the same conclusion. For the first half of his career, he was an effective officer. He, he was smart. He, he did his homework. He, he went back and he studied the files of the British and Russian service. And how did they run operations? You know, run operations over over decades, you know, very subtle things. And he, he really mastered that. After about 10 years, though, his paranoia got the better of him. By the early 1960s, when, when Kim Philby was exposed as a, a spy, Kim Philby, who had been his close friend and who had really, you know, taken him into his confidence and fooled him, frankly, you know. So here he was, the chief of counterintelligence, the man who was supposed to you know, detect these threats. And he had been fooled by a close personal friend. So that really had a psychological effect on Jim Angleton. That was January 1963. And after that, he was so paranoid that he, he, his paranoia got the better of his judgment. And he began interfering with, with operations as opposed to protecting them. And other officers who worked in the Soviet Russia division in the 1960s rebelled against Angleton and eventually forced him, you know, forced his hand because he was so paranoid that the, the U.S. was really running no effective operations against the Soviet Union. None, literally none, because every time they developed a source, Angleton said it was insecure. And so, you know, he didn't, he, his record at the end was not good. And in fact, the CIA eventually abolished that position the, the counterintelligence staff position and reassigned counterintelligence responsibilities more widely and more diffusely across the agency. The, the idea of having a counterintelligence czar was, was ultimately discredited by Angleton, who was the first counterintelligence czar. And, and, that, and that continues to this day. The CIA doesn't have, they have counterintelligence officers, but they don't have one man who reigns supreme the way Angleton did. Hmm. So that's how I would, that's how I describe in the ghost, that's my assessment of Angleton's effectiveness. And there's a lot of different opinions about Angleton, and I'm more critical than some, but that, I think that's, it's fair to say that's a consensus even of people in the CIA that, that he, that he outlived his Yeah, I've, I've seen something similar to that written in several different places, I seems like, and it really hurt operations. At the same time, I can totally understand how finding out that the one person in the world that you trusted more than anybody else turned out to be working for your greatest adversary, how that the effect that that would have on your mind, especially if you're already prone to paranoia, as it seems he was. So can you talk a little bit about the Philby Angleton relationship? Because it's one of, to me, it's one of the most amazing dynamics in espionage history. Yeah, it, it, it is. So just to recap, Angleton met Philby in, in 1944 at the OSS training school, and they became pals. Compared to most Americans, Angleton was a very cosmopolitan guy. And Philby had that sort of British disdain for the Yanks, you know. He looked down his nose at Americans and thought that they were naive and kind of generally inferior to the socially, you know, superior Brits. But he really liked Angleton, who was not a rube or naive in any way. Very cosmopolitan young man, spoke a lot of languages, and they became friends. Of course, Philby was angling to use him for intelligence purposes. Angleton never understood that. He was, he, 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 Philby by then was the chief of the, the British intelligence station in Washington. So he was a very senior official in the British service. And people said that, you know, he might well become director of the British service, the MI6. So Kim Philby operated at a very high level. Unbeknownst to Angleton and unbeknownst to his colleagues in the British service, Angleton, I mean, Philby had been recruited as a, as a communist spy in 
Cambridge, where he attended university in the early 1930s and had been reporting to a Soviet handler ever since. And so Philby skillfully rises, a very good spy by all accounts, um, very skillful at running operations and analyzing operations, and uh, rises in the British service until he comes to Washington in 1949 as the chief of the station. And he is reunited with his old friend, Jim Angleton. And Jim and Kim are fast buddies. They go out to eat at the Mayflower Hotel right here in downtown Washington. They have lunch regularly. They have drinking parties at, at, at Philby's house on Nebraska Avenue, where they down martinis by the gallon. They are really good friends. In 1951, though, the shadow of suspicion falls on Philby when two British spies flee the country. And they were about to be arrested by the FBI. And everybody knew that somebody had tipped them off so that they could flee the country. And the suspicion turned to Philby, the so-called third man. The two spies, the two British men defected, Donald McLean and Guy Burgess, friends of Philby's. And people turned to Philby and said, he's the third man. He's the other spy in Washington. His friend Jim Angleton comes and says, no, 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 no. Kim is misunderstood. He was just a victim of this Guy Burgess. These guys, they fooled him just like they fooled the rest of us. And so Philby was sent home. The CIA said, we don't trust this guy, even if we're not going to say he's a spy publicly. It wasn't until some 12 years later that it was revealed that, yes, Angleton was wrong. Philby was a spy all along. So that was the psychological trauma. And you're absolutely right. You know, it, and everybody who knew Angleton said that. that it was a tremendous blow when it turned out that Kim Philby was a spy. So it, that seems to have driven Angleton around the bend in 1963. Hmm. Do you think that he had a blind spot for Philby or was Philby simply that good at manipulating people around him? I, Philby was that good. He, I mean, he was an amazing, his ability to deceive and, you know, the fact that even when he was under total suspicion, he was so cool. If you ever seen the video, there's a video of him in 1955. I mean, he's getting grilled by reporters. You know, a lot of people didn't believe his story. A lot of people inside the CIA didn't believe his story. J. Edgar Hoover didn't believe his story. And Philby was so cool in deflecting the criticism. He had an explanation for everything. He was relaxed. He was never defensive. And he was totally believable. So he was truly a master spy. I do think that, you know, Angleton let his guard down. And that's, you know, that's what a great spy gets you to do. He spoke, he probably spoke more than he should have. But, you know, at that level, it was very hard. It's very hard for top intelligence professionals not to share confidences. I mean, that's how you get intelligence. You talk to another service and you get the access to their information. So, you know, the Brits were the pros and Philby was a friend. So Angleton spoke freely with him. And in retrospect, he spoke too freely. Hmm. Yeah, what a story. Yeah. Really, really yeah. amazing stuff there. And it it does make everything that happens afterward more easily digestible, I think. But this certainly caused a generation's worth of trouble for the CIA for as long as Angleton stayed in power there, right? Yes, yes. Unfortunate for sure. Yes, so speaking of, of his methods and everything, can you talk about what, what was it that made him so effective? Like what were the methods that he put into place for handling sources or for, you know, counterintelligence investigations and that sort of thing? Why was he better than his, his peers at his work? Well, because he took time to, to really study the history of, of Soviet intelligence operations and look how they had organized their operations to penetrate Western services and penetrate Western societies. So he was very on his guard about that. And he understood that, you know, there was, there were levels of multiple levels of deception involved. And that was, you know, one way that he, that he did it. Another way that he did it was by collecting secrets and by extensive and sometimes illicit surveillance. So for example, in 1958, he, in, he implements a, a program to open the mail of Americans, taking, getting an office at the post office in, in Queens in New York, in which the CIA personnel could, could take any international letter out of circulation, open it, copy it, file it, and put it back in. And this had been a very small Pentagon program. 
started in the 1950s during the Korean War. They basically wanted to see if U.S. soldiers had foreign girlfriends or were talking out of school and if they wanted to investigate a serviceman. They were opening the mail of a couple hundred servicemen a year. Angleton took over that program in 1955. And by 1958, they were opening like 8,000 letters a year. They sort of got the authorization of the postmaster general who didn't really want to know what was going on. But there was no legislative authorization of this. It was a violation of the agency's charter to open the letters of Americans and conduct an operation on U.S. soil. Angleton ignored you know, that formal prohibition on this type of activity, but he collected a lot of information. And so that's what he used in his counterintelligence analysis. Right. Back then, I mean, it's, it's easy to forget that letters were a primary form of communication, a lot longer duration than a phone call or anything like that. But international calls were a rarity at that time. So this was a pretty effective way of determining what kind of information is leaving the country or coming in, I would take it. Is that correct? Yeah. And they, and, and they had, they also, Angleton also presided over a, an agreement with the National Security Agency, which was intercepting telegrams, another form of, you know, common form of communication mm. at that time. So they could also put access with a list of names, say, give us the telegrams of any of these, you know, if, if these names pop up in a telegram, show us the telegram before it's sent. So he was collecting a lot of information that way even though it was illicit and a violation of the agency's charter. Do you know, happen to know how he implemented that? Were there CIA officers at the post office or did they train postal employees yes. to do the for them or what? No, the, the CIA was given an office at the postal facility. And, you know, there was a list developed by Angleton. And one of the clever things that Angleton did was he shared the take with FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover was worried about the propriety, the legality of, of this mail opening operation. So he didn't want FBI personnel to do it because if it was found out, it would reflect badly on him and his bureau. But if the CIA wanted to take responsibility for it, that was fine with J. Edgar Hoover. And so what Angleton did was he told Hoover, you know, if you want to see the mail of anybody, you know, just give me the name. And so Angleton and Hoover developed a, a list of a couple hundred names which changed over the years and, you know, changed regularly, but, and they opened all of their mail. So, and then if the, if the FBI, you know, the FBI, the information would go back to the FBI. And so Angleton made an ally out of J. Edgar Hoover, which was an accomplishment, bureaucratically speaking, because J. Edgar Hoover did not trust or like the CIA, and he could barely bring himself to talk to anybody in the CIA. He was so hostile to them. And Angleton very cleverly kind of appeased him with, with what he wanted, which was J. Edgar Hoover also loved secrets as a way of lev using leverage on political rivals and enemies. And so Angleton and Hoover had this kind of bond of using secrets as a way of, of preserving their power. That's amazing to me because on the surface, at least there's so many similarities between these two guys, their careers, no one can get anything over them, their fixtures in Washington. They believe in this all-encompassing intelligence collection, and yet they're constantly butting heads. So that's amazing that Angleton was able to figure out a way to get into good graces with Hoover. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, they, they these they have very similar goals, but you know, these they're masters of power, so they jealously guard their power, and their secrets, you know, were their power, and so the trading of secrets becomes a way to establish a relationship. But you know they're, they're allies. They're not friends. You know, they were, they were willing to right, do right. business together, but no, they, there was no, there was no personal sympathy between them. And by 1970, Hoover was so angry at the CIA, he cuts off all communication. And he says, no FBI person can meet in person with a CIA per person. All communication has to be done in writing and you have to show it to me first. That's how that that's how crazed wow. Hoover was about the CIA at the end. So Angleton's ability to work with him, at least in the through the mid 1960s, was you know part of his power. He had the FBI on his side. That's yeah, very very shrewd for sure to be able to kind of find the chink in Hoover's armor, so to speak, when so many other people were mm -hmm. unable to get anything over him ever. It seems like. Yeah. You mentioned that it had a names of a couple of hundred people. Were these American citizens under suspicion or was it like all of the employees at the Soviet embassy, for example, or what? 
this was more of a political list. It was members of mm. organizations, for example, that banned the bomb, kind of the anti-nuclear movement of the 1950s, w- women's strike for peace, people in either the Communist oh, Party or the Socialist Workers Party, leaders of civil rights organizations, you know, were considered very controversial at that time. Hoover put their names on the list. So it was a wide range of people of interest to the agency, not for any specific wrongdoing, <laughs> but because there was no probable cause or there, there was no threshold of what defined you know, the reason for opening somebody's mail. It was just Angleton wanted to know. Um, so, And in that regard, it's, it, it, it's worth mentioning that one of the people who Angleton was opening the mail of was a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. And Angleton started opening Oswald's mail in November 1959, Hmm. when Oswald was not world famous, when he was utterly obscure high school dropout and dropout of the Marines. Jim Angleton was already paying Hmm. very close attention to him in November 1959. And that attention continued, close attention, continued for the next four years. And that's another story that I tell in The Ghost, which is a story that has not really been told in detail before, which is the pre-assassination, the CIA's pre-assassination interest in Lee Harvey Oswald. And that interest was held most intensely by Jim Angleton. Wow. You know, it's amazing. I was just about to comment before you mentioned Oswald. I was going to say it's clear why they kept this program of opening the mail so close hold because, you know, the optics of it getting out that they're looking at the communications, the private communications of civil rights leaders and peace organizers and that kind of thing. That's, that's a terrible look, right? Like by any stretch of the imagination, despite the fact that yes, those people are, are vulnerable to influence by, you know, Soviets and, and that sort of thing. But you know, when you mention Oswald under suspicion from 1959 yeah. on or under no, observation, I can say, which it really just shows that he is three steps Lingual, ahead of everybody else in so many when ways. Lingual was exposed in 1974 by Seymour Hirsch, reporter for the New York Times. That's when Angleton was fired. I mean, because the public revelation that that they had been, that the CIA had been spying on Americans that was not acceptable to the leadership of the, of the CIA or to the Congress and Angleton was fired. So yeah, it was not something that was publicly defensible. Right, right. Yeah. If you've got a, the FBI has got a named subject of an investigation that they think has ties to the Soviet Union. Yeah, of course, it's way more palatable to open their mail um, in right. the public's eye. But if it's like, a, I don't like this guy because they're protesting against the use of apocalyptic weapons, you know, that's certainly not a good reason to be opening yeah. their mail privately. Right. By the way, before we go on, I want to take a moment to fill you guys in on the newest tool that I'm wearing and carrying in daily life. It's the Donovan non-metallic knife from Black Triangle. If you aren't familiar with Black Triangle, then you're really missing out. I love these guys because they put the dagger in cloak and dagger. If you've been following me for a while now, then you probably already know why Black Triangle has called their newest non-metallic knife the Donovan. It's named after General William Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Under Donovan, the OSS was unconventional, unexpected, and highly effective, just like Black Triangle tools. The Donovan is manufactured here in the United States, is made entirely of G10 composite, and comes with a thermoplastic sheath and a couple of amazing extras, which you'll have to see for yourself. You can find it at blacktriangle.com. That's B-L-K triangle.com. You can also get 15% off your first order with Black Triangle using the discount code SPYCRAFT101 or by navigating to blacktriangle.com slash SPYCRAFT101. I love mine, and I know you're going to love yours, too. So, Jeff, yeah, back to you. I, I also wanted to ask you, th- this is a, a clear violation of people's civil rights. I think everyone can agree with that, but this is not necessarily the kind of thing that the CIA was known for during that time period. It was known more for things like covert action, like the invasion at the Bay of Pigs, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But Angleton, he was never, correct me if I'm wrong, he was never really a major proponent of that type of covert action, was he? He was more about the all-encompassing 
intelligence collection, wasn't he? Yeah, you know, Angleton came up. There were two. There were two kind of components of the early CIA. There was the Office of Special Operations, and there was the Office of Policy Coordination. Now, those no, they, those names don't tell you anything, but the Office of Policy Coordination was the covert action arm of the CIA, and the Office of Special Operations was the foreign intelligence collection arm of the CIA. And Angleton came up in the collection arm, not in the operations arm. And one of the reasons why he, Dulles, agreed to establish the counterintelligence staff was because the security on the covert operations side was very poor. It, it was very poorly organized. And Angleton understood that and was able to advise people about how to op- organize their operations so that they wouldn't be so prone to penetration. Now, he didn't prevent some of the ill-advised and unsuccessful covert operations that were penetrated. For example, the Bay of Pigs operation. The security was terrible. The, the Cuban security forces were able to understand what the United States and its allies in Miami were planning to do, and that enabled them to win at the Bay of Pigs. So the, the covert operations side was different, certainly different than the, than the intelligence collection side where, and counterintelligence side where Angleton mostly operated. That said, Angleton was a very aggressive operations officer. And while we think of him as counterintelligence and sort of we think of that as a defensive posture, Angleton, like his mentor, Norman Holmes Pearson, was a proponent of offensive counterintelligence which is when you deflect the enemy's efforts to penetrate you, you actually have an opportunity to penetrate them. So Angleton was a master of this kind of complex thinking where to lure the enemy into a position of vulnerability. So he was a intelligence collector primarily, but Angleton was also an operations officer specifically. Hmm. So he and, and came so up for example, with the concepts? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, when the agency was trying to assassinate Castro, Angleton was one of the people they consulted because, hmm. and, you know, it was thought he was the kind of person who could help out in doing something like that. So, yeah, and this was, I think this was one of the surprising things that was learned about him afterwards was while he had this reputation as a counterintelligence officer, the people who came in and looked at his files afterwards, his, his immediate successor, a man named George Calaris, a veteran officer, said, you know, Angleton was really an operations officer primarily. And what he was doing primarily was he wasn't running a staff. He was running an operation. He was running operations. So that side of him was a very secretive side because it wasn't run through the normal channels, lines of authority within the the operations directorate within the op- the clandestine service. He was running sort of operations that in a modern way, we would say, you know, were kind of off the books. So that's how sensitive they hmm. were. I see. Well, what was his relationship like with his, his peers at that time, these senior guys in the CIA? Because in counterintelligence, like you said, that's often internally focused. So typically, you know, I wouldn't think that intelligence organizations really want a very, very powerful CI guy who is constantly looking at their own people and constantly finding fault in their own activities, right? That's kind of a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, no. And and this is the dynamic that takes over in the second half of Angleton's career. I would say after 1963, he is interfering with operations and the Soviet Russia division is very resentful. They're like, we are not running any operations because of this, because of these, you know, irrational objections from Jim Angleton. And it, it, a, a huge bureaucratic struggle ensues in which Angleton is, is finally forced to back down. But the reason that he was able to maintain that position was because he had very good relations, first with CIA Director Alan Dulles, who helped him create the counterintelligence position. And then with director Richard Helms, who was also a a close friend of his and who protected him from criticism and who was a big believer in his methods. And so the effect by the end was really paralysis in the Soviet Russia division, which was why Angleton at the end of his career became quite controversial within the agency. People said, this guy is hindering our ability to do our job. Angleton said, I am doing my job. This struggle went on for 
you know, close to five years from 1965 to 1970, a very bitter struggle within the Soviet Russia division. And then Angleton finally loses some of his authority. It no longer has veto power over certain covert operations. So, but, you know, his mole hunt, which he launches at this time, he believes by 1960, by the time Philby defects, by 1963 and after, that the Soviets have managed to insert an agent somewhere in the CIA hierarchy. And Angleton is searching for him. And in the course of that, he a, a number of officers fall under suspicion. And since they're under suspicion, they are immediately removed from agency operations. And in effect, their careers were over. And Angleton ended the career of about a dozen people. And when the CIA went back to look at those cases, they concluded none of them were working for the Soviet Union and that he had ruined their careers really over for no good reason, that there was no rational suspicion of, of these people. And so, you know, that too created bitterness within the CIA. And after Angleton was fired, the CIA went and paid out money to some wow. of these employees because they knew that they had been wrong. It was a story that I tried to get for the book. And it's a story that's very closely held by the CIA. I could not really penetrate how many officers were, you know, received compensation for losing their jobs in Angleton's mole hunt, but it was more than a couple. So the agency itself wow. understood that that, that Angleton had gone too far and that they needed to compensate people who had not been treated fairly. Were most of these guys, to your knowledge, were they all in the like the Soviet and Eastern European division or were they spread throughout? Well, Angleton was working on comments made by a defector, Anatoly Golitsyn, who had been a KGB official. He had been the, the KGB station chief in Finland. He was not a high ranking KGB official, but he was not low ranking either. And Golitsyn said that he knew about the mole and he convinced Angleton that the mole was real. I think Golitsyn was making it up. I, I don't think there was a mole. Certainly Angleton never found one and the CIA went back and revisited the issue a couple of times and other analysts didn't find the mole either. So I don't think there, there was a mole, but Angleton made a very persuasive case and using the clues, so Golitsyn told Angleton that the Soviet spy was known as Sasha, that his last name might have begun with a K. So Angleton pulled the files of a bunch of officers who, whose last name began with K and said, oh, maybe it's him. And so, for example, there was a guy who was up for a job in Moscow. So he, you know, he'd done a dozen years and this was like, he was getting his big break. He was going to go to Moscow, you know, front lines of the Cold War. He was really excited. He gets called in and they said, pal, you are the next station chief in Trinidad and Tobago. And, you know, the guy was crushed and his career was over. And it was all because Golitsyn said that the mole's last name began with oh, K wow. and his last name began with K. And Angleton didn't really have any more information than that. So, you know, that was how he, he was so paranoid that he didn't question his own information. And that's mm. how the injustice was done. That's how the, you know, the mole hunt did tremendous damage to the CIA. And in my view, and I explain my view in, in more detail in the ghost, because it's a complicated issue. I don't think there was a mole. You know, other people disagree, but that was my conclusion. There really was a mole. So Angleton was kind of at the end. He was kind of chasing phantoms, in my view. Yeah, very understandable, especially after the we've talked about this deep seated paranoia he had. What was it, do you think, about Galitzin that made him believable when he had so little real information, real concrete information to provide? Well, you know the CIA didn't really have that type of defector from inside the KGB before. We'd had another int military intelligence officer, Peter Popoff, who had provided a lot of information in the, in the 1950s before he was caught by the KGB and executed. So one was just a sheer, there was nobody else like Golitsyn who had come from inside the KGB. But I think Golitsyn knew how to feed Angleton's paranoia. And so I think he was a little bit, Angleton was a little bit in his overreaction to being fooled by Kim Philby. He was too eager to believe Anatoly Golitsyn. And uh, he went too far in the other direction, in the, in the paranoid direction.
So I think that's how he came to make those mistakes. Right. Yeah. I can, I can imagine somebody telling you what you're already predisposed, predisposed to believe is a yes, terrible and, trap to fall and, into. And it's a very human trait for us to do that as well. Yeah. And I interviewed a guy who eventually a retired CIA guy who had studied all of this. And, and he told me that, you know, that was his conclusion in the aftermath of all of this was that Angleton was just too trusting of Galitzin, and it just didn't, it, it didn't make any sense. If I'm not mistaken, Galitzin basically cast doubt on every other lower level defector that came before him. Is that right? He said that those guys were all Soviet plants when in reality, it's very possible that Galitzin himself was a Soviet plant. Is that right? I never found evidence that Galitzin was a Soviet plant. I mean, you know, Angleton, by believing Galitzin, did a lot of damage to CIA operations. So people say, oh, well, that must have been part of a Soviet design. I, I don't think that's the case. I think Galitzin was a, was a smooth operator and he knew if it to, to be continued to be paid attention to and cultivated and supported financially. He had to keep Angleton, you know, on a string. He had to keep Angleton excited about his information. And so he made up things, he added things, he knew how to speak to Angleton's vanity and his paranoia. But I don't think Galitzin was acting at the behest. I don't think Galitzin was a false defector. No, I found no evidence hmm. of that. And I don't think anybody in the CIA ever found any evidence of that. And remember, these things were studied very carefully. There were three or four, there were three internal studies of Angleton's, you know, key counterintelligence issues under Angleton's reign. And there was a 10 volume study written by another officer of all of Angleton did running to thousands of pages and most of which has never been made public, but the conclusions were not favorable to Angleton. Um, and they did not indicate that Galitzin was any kind of Soviet spy. And no, and nobody, nobody, none of those retired officers who, who spoke out after the fall of the Soviet Union, KGB officers came forward and told their stories. I nobody see. ever said, oh, you know, we fooled you guys by sending Galitzin over there. Nobody ever came forward with mm. a story like mm. that. So... I doubt it. Interesting. Interesting. That's amazing that he was able to, I don't know if I'd say inadvertently, but unintentionally cause this tremendous level of paralysis through the CIA and yeah. defect from the Soviet Union, but effectively carry out their desired end state at the same time and personally profit from the whole situation. That's that's quite amazing. Quite a hat trick. <laughs> yeah. Whatever happened to Golitsyn? Is he, is he living under an assumed name somewhere now in the US or, or what? Golitsyn kind of vanished and he was in some equivalent of witness protection. I don't believe he's alive, but I can't prove that he's dead. Mm. Gotcha. <laughs> so he would be very, very old now if he was alive. I imagine he's he is dead, but there, there's nothing there's nothing official about that. That's never been confirmed. Actually, but thanks for reminding me. I'm going to go back and start asking some people because it would be a good story. <laughs> there is no official verification that he's dead. Okay, I'll put I it that way. I see. Yeah, that's one of the unfortunate things about trying to cover these espionage stories is you have to wait for 50 years after something happens for them to declassify it. You know, so that's why oftentimes yeah. that's why I'm still stuck in the in the 60s and 70s because that's as far as things have been declassified this far. I would love to know something from the 90s. Right. No, and 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 and, and yeah, and and that that's the time frame in which you begin to learn about secret intelligence operations, and people feel comfortable to talk about them, and agencies feel comfortable releasing information. So we're really only, you know, have a real clear picture of CIA operations through the mid 1970s. After that, it's still classified. Yep, yep. Just have to bide our time, I suppose. Yeah. So I want to go ac actually backtrack a little bit because there was something I meant to ask you about earlier, and that is. Besides Angleton, early on in his career, he had this very critical, influential relationships in Italy and with the Vatican as well. But he also developed major relationship with Israeli intelligence a few years later, didn't he? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so a a Angleton's very important relationship with the Israeli intelligence begins in, the, in his OSS service in 1945 in Rome. As the war ended, the Jews of Central Europe and Germany naturally wanted to flee the scene of the Holocaust. And so Jewish refugees began heading south to the ports on Italy's eastern coast to catch boats 
to go to Palestine. And that's what the Jewish agency, the, the organization, the only organization that international Jewish population had was desperate to get these people out, get them out of uh, the terrible conditions that they were in and get them to get them to the Middle East where they wanted to create a Jewish state and where they, they eventually did create Israel in 1948. So Angleton helps and meets some of these operatives who are trying to assist the Jewish refugees heading for the Middle East. And that's where he meets some of the figures who eventually become leading figures in the Israeli service, which is founded in 1951, the Mossad, the Institute for Special Operations in Hebrew. So Angleton becomes friends with the early leaders of the Mossad and close friends, close personal friends. And he makes a point of going to Israel pretty much hmm. every year from the 1950s on to spend time with his friends. And it's a very fascinating progression for him because as a young man at Yale and in Italy, in fascist Italy, Angleton was really anti-Semitic in his, in his political views, very negative comments about Jews as a group, stereotypical. That's him as a young man and maybe immature, but by, you know, by his mid thirties, when he's visiting Israel, he's very much a, a, a Zionist and one of the heads of the Israeli service. He, he was the biggest Zionist of all the Americans. He becomes an avid supporter of Israel within the U.S. government. And he also has an unusual position within the CIA. Not only is he chief of counterintelligence, but he is the chief of the Israel desk in the clandestine service. So he actually wears two hats, something that really never happens. But because of his close connections, he was allowed to do that. So he was in this very strong position to influence CIA operations in Israel, Mossad operations in the United States or Mossad operations overseas. It really gives him a very strong position in anything, any U.S. policy issue related to Israel. Right. That, that is very odd that he would be the head of a country desk, one country out of you know, 200, as well as the head of, of counterintelligence for the whole organization. Did he ask for that or was he assigned it based on his Mossad contacts? Any idea? He asked for it and Dulles gave it to him. You know, Dulles was not, Alan Dulles was not a rigorous administrator. He was, mm. he, he operated in a very personalistic style. And so Angleton wanted it and he just gave it to him. You know, he didn't care about, I think. about, about procedure or anything like that. Okay. On that note, you mentioned the anti-Semitism early on, and your book opens with his relationship with the poet Ezra Pound, who we haven't really discussed on the podcast yet, but a very influential guy in his young life who went on to you know do broadcasts and support the the fascist state in Italy. So, what yeah. was this change? What was this sea change in Angleton's life where he went from anti-Semitism to a huge proponent of Israel? Was it seeing what happened to the Jews during the war or some other event? Yeah, I think it was in Italy in the 1930s, fascism was respectable. It was popular. You know, it was especially among people like, you know, well-to-do Americans. That was, you know, it was it was perfectly common for them to support fascists. The fascists were anti-communist. And so there was a level of comfort there. Hugh Angleton had lots of contacts in the, in the fascist government. When the you know, fascism was taking over Europe and and then with the revelations of the Holocaust, fascism, you know, took on a different light. And the people who had once, you know, flirted with it or been sympathetic to it began to back away. And I think that was, you know, that was Angleton. He also, you know, he also began through his contacts in Israel, he began to meet Jewish people. And so, you know, I don't think he had a lot of contact with Jews you know, before that in his life, when he met the Israeli Jews, the Zionists, he actually liked them very much and his anti-Semitic stereotypes kind of faded away. And in fact, he became very much a, the biggest Zionist of the lot, as Meyer Amit, the head of the Mossad in the 1960s said. And as I show in the book, Angleton was, I don't know if instrumental is the right word, it was on his watch that the Israelis stole a huge amount hmm. of fissile material from the United States and used it to build their first 
nuclear weapons. Angleton knew all of the people who were on the secret Israeli program to build nuclear mm. weapons, mm. and he didn't do anything to stop it. He didn't do anything to investigate it. And I talked to one of his colleagues or got the notes of one of his colleagues who said that Angleton had actually assisted the Israelis in, in obtaining nuclear weapons against the wishes of U.S. policymakers. So that was part wow. of the reason why Angleton was revered in Israel, frankly, was because I believe he helped them obtain nuclear weapons when nobody hmm. else would. How, how in the world? So that was that's also part of his, his legacy. I can imagine. How in the world did he weather that storm with facilitating the smuggling of nuclear materials out of the country to a foreign country. How in the world does, how does he get through that with his career intact, I wonder? Well, it was not known at all during his career. The efforts to investigate, ah, it was, it, there were efforts to investigate it after, in the Carter administration, after he had left the government and the CIA scientific community, you know, the CIA resisted those efforts to investigate. And so the, the full story really didn't come out until, you know, much later in the 80s and 90s and was in my book, In the Ghost, some Israeli intelligence officials fill in some of the details of the story. And this, the documentation that I found, which was the kind of a informal report put together by another counterintelligence officer who worked for, Ang for Angleton for many years and who was stationed in Israel. And he wrote a memo before his death in which he laid out the case for how the Israelis had stolen the material on Angleton's watch. And that was really a key part of my findings that had never been made public before that kind of internal scrutiny of his, of his actions. But, you know, this was, none of this became public until long after his death. Hmm. I see. I see. That makes sense. Yeah. That would have been impossible to weather. I would imagine if it had come out closer, but he, of course, he did eventually lose his job and kind of leave the CIA in disgrace, essentially. How exactly did that come about so, after so many years in power? Well, in 1972, Richard Helms, the director of the CIA and Angleton's friend who had protected him, you know, I spoke before about this power struggle between Angleton and the Soviet Russia division over control of, of, of operations in the Soviet Union. And eventually, by 1970, Helms kind of brokers a truce, and Angleton doesn't interfere as much anymore, but Angleton keeps his job. Well, in 1972, um, President Nixon, after winning re-election, demands, demands Helms's resignation, and Helms gets himself appointed to be ambassador of Iran. At that point, Angleton didn't have a protector as the director of the CIA. And the new director of the CIA, Bill Colby, was much more skeptical about Angleton's theories about the mole, was much more disturbed by the, the paralysis in Soviet operations, was bothered by the, the, the spying on Americans. And so Colby, after 1973, is looking to kind of maneuver Angleton out of power. Um, cuts back on Colby, for example, cancels the lingual operation, the mail opening operation. Colby said, this is, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. This is beyond our charter and I'm stopping it. And so without his bureaucratic protector as director, Angleton is vulnerable. At the end of 1974, New York Times reporter Seymour Hirsch gets wind of the domestic spying operation and people inside the CIA start telling him about it. Yeah, we were spying on Americans. And there had been opposition within the CIA. A lot of people said, we shouldn't be doing this. You know, we're spying on our own kids. This is not our job, you know. And so there had been internal debate about it, none of which came out in public until much later. But internally, well, when Hirsch came to Colby and said, look, I've got the story of this operation, Colby didn't deny it. And with that, they knew that they had a big story because if the CIA wanted to, you know, kind of downgrade the story, they would have denied it flatly or they would have said something. But Hirsch and the New York Times took Colby's position as confirmation of what they were saying. So they blew up this story and it was not banner headline, but it was like a triple decker headline on the New York Times in December, 1975. <clears throat> and when that came out, Colby had the excuse that he wanted. He, he fired Angleton. 
President Ford and his chief of staff, Donald Rumsfeld, didn't object. There was no way to defend the agency on from this charge. So, you know, Angleton was kind of disgraced and fired, which he was very bitter about. He felt that he had only done, he had only served the agency well, but his actions were not publicly defensible and the agency was not going to go to bat for him under those circumstances. You know, by 1975, the agency had been implicated in the Watergate burglary. These former CIA people were, you know, breaking and entering on behalf of the president. You know, the CIA was suffering a lot of bad publicity in the 1970s, and this revelation was among the worst. So that was how Angleton was was fired. And you know, it's very poignant at the end of my book, you know, this man who spent his whole life in the shadows, utterly unknown, even within the CIA, people didn't know who Jim Angleton was. And the next thing you know, he's got TV cameras camped out on his lawn of his house in Arlington, you know, and the spy is like, you know, caught in the these bright lights. And it was a very shocking development for him personally. And uh, he took, you know, he, he, he didn't take it very well. He felt humiliated, disgraced. He had a lot to answer for. And so that was kind of the end of his career. And a brilliant man, no question, fascinating. In my book, I'm, you know, fairly critical of the actions that he took in places like the spying on Americans and the handling of the Oswald and the surveillance operations. But I try to give him his, he was a very influential character. A lot of people really admired him, certainly in the early parts of his career, were very impressed by his thinking and his mastery of the intelligence profession. So a, a, a disappointing, almost tragic end for him personally, you know, a more complex story for, you know, U.S. citizens and for the CIA itself. You know, Angleton was not one of the heroes of the CIA. He was more, he's regarded by the agency itself as a more problematic character. And, you know, in some ways, a, a warning of how, you know, an intelligence professional can, can go awry. Right. That's, that's very unfortunate. I think early on in your book, you describe him as possibly the most powerful unelected official in Washington during his tenure at the CIA. And for him to have these personal flaws that eventually outshined and overcame his personal talents is really unfortunate because it sent the CIA down a, a very dark road and the American intelligence community and the American government in many ways down a dark road as well. So you have to wonder where we would be now if he had left that position earlier or if he had not had those, those flaws that blinded him to what was really going on. Well, Dick Helms always said, or said later in life that, that he, should have, he should have moved Angleton earlier. That was one regret that Helms had, that Ang Angleton, he, he was a flawed personality at the end, drinking too much. And Helms regretted that he had not curbed his power sooner. Hmm. It would have saved the agency a world of trouble. That's true, if he had done that. Absolutely. Seems that way. Did he say why he did not move him earlier than that? He thought he was still just untouchable, or was he doing a good job on other things, or, or what exactly? He said he, he just trusted him hmm. even after the point where he, he probably didn't deserve that trust. That's a, that's a common story for sure. That's oh. happened many times in the past, unfortunately. Yeah. I do have one final question for you, and I think you've already at least partially answered this one. But a lot of people have, in the past, they have accused Angleton himself of being the mole. And I wonder, you know, you've already talked about this a little bit, but why do you think that is? And what do you think about those accusations? I think they're ridiculous. I mean, this was one of these agencies that one of these stories that the agency investigated and found no basis of it. The story originated with another counterintelligence officer who worked with Angleton and believed in his theory of the mole. And by 1973, when the, you know, this the damage that had been done to Soviet operations in the late 1960s was common knowledge inside the CIA. And people talked about Angleton as, you know, having screwed things up. And this guy went back and used Angleton's flawed methods to analyze Angleton's career. And he said, maybe since he screwed things up, maybe he was the mole. It's pure conjecture. There was no, there was no hint of that Angleton had been in touch with a Soviet intelligence officer, the idea that Angleton had communist sympathies. I mean, let me tell you, let me stress you, as somebody who spent a couple of years investigating him, 
It's ridiculous. There is no foundation to it. it. To me, it is not possible that Jim Angleton was a communist sympathizer or helping the KGB. That was ant antithetical to everything he stood for. And there's no evidence for it. So I don't take it seriously at all. Okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of my thinking as well, but I haven't looked into it anywhere near the depth that you have. But it's it's yeah. the kind of thing that it's it's so tantalizing, you know, to think about that because so many high level defectors have been found and double agents and all that that it it kind of gets the imagination going. Yeah, and yes, I mean in the intelligence business is prone to this kind of parlor game. And yes, very improbable things happen. You know, serious people didn't think Kim Philby was a spy, and he was, you know. But you know, when you look hard at it and you look at it from every angle and, and you don't look at it with the purpose of, for the purpose of trying to vindicate your own theory, but if you look at it just as like, what is, how to assess all the evidence, I see no evidence of it. Literally not one. And when I ask people who think that Angleton was the mole, I say, you know, show me one piece of evidence that supports that theory, other than the conjecture that you know, other than the reality that these operations were disrupted and that harmed the CIA. But aside from that, is there any evidence of intent or contact or sympathy with the KGB? There is none, I assure you. Okay. <laughs> That's about as solid as an answer as we're going to get on that one, I think. Case closed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you. This has been really enlightening, Jeff. And the book, once again, is called The Ghost. It's been out for a couple of years now, but easily available. I just finished it a couple of weeks ago myself, and it's a fascinating story. You know, we, we have not by any means covered all of his story. We've covered, I don't know, half or less probably of what you've written about in the book, really. So I encourage all my listeners to go out there and pick yeah. this up. It's really interesting. He's an endlessly fascinating character, and you should read as much about him as you can. So thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Can I just throw in one plug for my next book? Because yes, I was people, just about to ask you what you're working on now. Please if, go ahead. If, if people are interested in this book, my next book is called Scorpion's Dance, and it's about the CIA and Watergate. And specifically, it's about a man who we've talked about a little bit today, Richard Helms. And so hmm. Scorpion's Dance, which will be out next June in the 50th anniversary of Watergate, is completes a trilogy of spies that I've written. Our Man in Mexico about Wynn Scott, the Ghost about Jim Angleton and Scorpion's Dance about Richard Helms. These three men were all in the OSS at the same time. They were all friends and they all rose in the CIA in the first 25 years. Scott is the field man, Angleton is kind of the intellectual and Helms as the bureaucrat. And so the story uh, that is told in Scorpion's Dance is really the story of Richard Helms and Richard Nixon and how that culminated in the Watergate scandal, but it's also related to the story of Angleton and the story of Wynne Scott and the story of how the CIA rose to power in those first 25 years. So if you like the ghost or you like what we're talking about here, I think your listeners will also enjoy Scorpion's Dance coming next year. I believe it. I'm looking forward to it. And I actually, I'm really looking forward to reading your book about Wynne Scott as well, because I don't know much about him, but I do know that Mexico City was a real hotbed for many years. And most people don't really associate that as a as an, a an espionage centric location. But I, I have a feeling I'm going to read a lot of surprising stuff in there as well. Yes, definitely. You will enjoy our man in Mexico. Good, good. And, you know, like I said, we barely scratched the surface on a few things here. We only just briefly talked about Lee Harvey Oswald and JFK. And I'd like to kind of preemptively invite you on again later on to talk about JFK, because that is certainly a big topic to discuss, especially with CIA involvement or purported CIA involvement. So maybe we can sit down again at a later date and talk about that as well. So I have something coming on that, uh, a news story, which I will publish probably in the next week. And you will be very interested. I'll make, oh, okay. I'll make sure you see a copy. Of yeah, it. please do. So, yes, I look forward to talking about that. That's worth a show in itself. Absolutely. I believe it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this, Jeff. It's been a great interview. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Ted C. and Nick M. With your support, I've been able to fund my research and publication across multiple platforms to date.
Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.